Hello, my name is Phil, Phil Chadder, and I'm the chaplain to Brixton Prison. And today I'm delighted to be speaking with you on a passage from the Bible, chapter 12 of Matthew's Gospel. And we're going to be looking together at verses 1 to 21. Now the thought of school will conjure up different responses for each of us. For some, school will have been a place of real freedom, where an inspirational teacher took you under his or her wing and gave you the freedom within a secure environment to flourish and become the person that you were designed to be. For others, though, thoughts of school conjure up an altogether different picture. For them, school was a place of arbitrary rules, a place where individuality was suppressed, a place where there was no freedom, just a blind conformity to a code of conduct which was just there. It was the way it was, and if you wanted to fit in, you'd better just get used to it. Your performance was measured by the extent to which you could conform to hand-me-down rules. Two very different kinds of school. And in our reading from Matthew's Gospel today, we're introduced to two very different kinds of school. The chapter break in our Bible uh, can actually throw us off this scent. So let's just peer back over the fence to the end of chapter 11. And let me read verse 28 to you. Come to me, says Jesus, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Come into my school, he says. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now let's ignore the chapter division, let's pretend it's not there and read on. At that time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples, literally his learners, it's the same root word as in verse 29. And now Jesus is with his learners who are in the school of Christ and they're learning what it's like to come to him and learn from him. Matthew is introducing us to the school of Christ. Jesus has invited the weary and the burdened to come and learn from him. And here we have Jesus' disciples, his learners, weary, hungry, and finding out what a good place it is to be in the presence of their master, their teacher. And as we spy on them in their school, it oozes an easy relationship. He's with them. They're with him. This school of Christ are literally on a field trip. And it's so easy. They're walking together. There's little echoes of, of Eden, doesn't it? Here is God himself walking with his people. No great fanfare. No struggle. An easy relationship with these learners, these pupils in the school of Christ. That's what we see as we spy on the school of Christ. But we're not the only people spying on them. In verse 2, we read the Pharisees saw this. Now this can be no accident. Jesus and his disciples are in a field. Now for me, it conjures up faintly comic images of Pharisees in field camouflage, maybe disguised as bushes. Or perhaps they'd splashed out and hired a pantomime cow outfit and were lurking nonchalantly, spying on the school of Christ. And they hit the jackpot. They saw what they were hoping to see. They see the disciples picking some ears of corn. And it was the Sabbath. That's fantastic. You know, the front end of the pantomime cow and the back end would have leapt for joy. Maybe even collapsed into a heap. They caught them out. Jesus' disciples were breaking the rules. Not rules from the Bible, but their rules, the Pharisees' rules, their traditions. Yes, the Bible says, keep the Sabbath holy. Six days you're to work, and the seventh you are to rest. Now that seventh day, the Sabbath, was to be a delightful day, where you step back from the everyday hustle and bustle of life, and you rest in the relationship with your living God. What a joy, what a thing of blessing. 
But what the Pharisees and their ilk had done was to surround that day, that beautiful day, with burdensome rules. In fact, they'd manufactured 39 rules to stop you breaking the Sabbath. And picking an ear of corn when you were hungry looked just a little bit too much like a full-scale harvest. And that was a big no. You see, Matthew is here introducing us not only to the school of Christ, but to the school of rules. Introducing us to a school where there's a a permanent league table of self-righteousness. Keep these rules and you're in. Break them and you're out. And if you want to strive to reach God and, and succeed in this school of rules, you need to negotiate yourself through a burdensome maze of man-made rules. Now, if I was to ask you, you know, which school do you go to? I've no doubt you'd say, oh, I go to the school of Christ. I know him and I love him and I want to serve him. But the school of rules is a very insipid one and exerts a pull on those, even those who have enrolled in the school of Christ. I think for most of us, there is a Pharisee lurking not too far below the surface of our lives. I don't know about you, but for me, it's very possible for my view of myself to swing between two opposite poles. While I'm living up to my self-imposed rules and standards, I feel confident in my relationship with God. But then I'm prone to feeling proud and unsympathetic to people around me who might be failing. I look down on them. And in those other times when I'm not living up to my standards, I feel humbled, but I don't feel confident in my relationship with God. I feel like a failure. And when I'm working out of this position, when I'm working out of the school of rules, I cannot be confident in my relationship with God and humble at the same time. I'm either swaggering or snivelling. And that is a million miles away from the school of Christ. You see someone enrolled in the school of Christ. If I'm there, my view of myself is not based on myself as a moral high achiever. The wonder of the gospel is that I do not have to climb a league table of self-righteousness. Martin Luther came up with a phrase that the eggheads among us uh, would like. He said that in the school of Christ, I am simul justus et peccator. I'm at one and the same time sinful, a hopeless moral failure, and yet accepted by Christ. Somebody else said that I'm so bad that Jesus had to die for me, but I'm so loved that he was glad to die for me. And in the school of Christ, I can be led by him deeper and deeper into humility and awareness of my own moral wretchedness, and at the same time into deeper and deeper confidence. I'm neither swaggering, nor snivelling in the school of Christ. And Matthew in these verses introduces us to these two schools in the first two verses. Then in verses three to eight, Jesus puts a metaphorical bomb under the school of rules. The antidote to religious rules in us is to open your Bible and understand it. The Pharisees saw the Bible as a rule book to which they'd added numerous other rules. What a heavy burden to be carried by those in the school of rules. But Jesus says to them, they haven't understood the Bible. Verse three, haven't you read? Verse five, haven't you read? Verse seven, if you know what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Well, he wouldn't have condemned the innocent. There's a common factor in each of Jesus' corrections of their misunderstandings, and it's this. The Pharisees saw the Bible as containing obstacles that you had to kind of leap over, placed there by a God reluctant to engage with his people, really wanting to keep them at arm's length. Whereas the Bible is in fact a love story, opening with God, walking at ease with his people. But we spurned that and were expelled from his presence. And the rest of the Bible is God wooing us back 
to himself, making it possible for us again to walk with him. The Bible is not a straitjacket there to stifle us, but is a summons back to a gracious and loving God. I remember reading about a piece of artwork that was hanging in a gallery somewhere or other. And this piece of, uh, piece of artwork, from a distance, appeared simply to be the face of a man. But if you were to approach the piece and ins inspect it closely, it was actually made out of words, and not just any words. The artist had transcribed onto the canvas the words of the New Testament, and he'd highlighted them in such a way as to depict the face of Christ. It's very clever and striking. And you could do the same with the Old Testament. The Bible that the Pharisees had in their hand was a portrait in advance of the Lord Jesus. Yet they'd so overlaid it with their own silly rules and desire for self-righteousness that they'd lost sight of the message of the Bible altogether. They were in the presence of the one greater than the temple. They were standing there in the presence of the Lord of the Sabbath and they were sniping at those enrolled in the school of Christ. Well, despite Jesus' demolition of their position, the, the Pharisees are having none of it. And they try to set a trap for Jesus, who is very happy to have a showdown with them. He goes into their synagogue in verse 9 and steps happily into their trap. They present a man with a shriveled hand, another example of someone who is weary and burdened. And sure enough, he comes to Jesus and he finds rest. Jesus heals him. But the Pharisees hate him and plot to kill him. The school of rules simply cannot be doing with the school of Christ. So in verses 1 to 14, we see this clash of two schools. One which places an intolerable burden on its followers, and another whose yoke is easy. Well, in verse 15 onwards, we leave behind the school of rules and we're shown a portrait of the headmaster of the school of Christ. We're given a portrait of the Lord Jesus. At my old school in the Great Hall, we would have assemblies there, and there were portraits of former headmasters. And as far as I remember, all, without exception, wanted to exude a sense of stern, aloof authority. And as they sat for the artist, they wanted to convey a mixture of uh, discipline and, and excellence. And I really don't think I'd have wanted to have been at the school when any of them was the headmaster. But how different it is in the school of Christ. The one who can invite the weary and the burdened to come to him is the one who will not break a bruised reed and will not snuff out a smouldering wick. Wouldn't you want to enrol in his school? The first 21 verses of chapter 12 place a prospectus into our hands and invite us to enrol in the school of Christ. Have you done that? And if you have done that, are you slipping back into the school of rules? The school of rules, the school of rules breaks bruised reeds and snuffs out smouldering wicks. It's not a happy place to be. And if we make that our permanent home, we cannot have a place in the school of Christ. The two are not compatible. The school of rules introduces a league table of self-righteousness and evicts Christ and shatters us. If we live up to the league table, we'll feel proud, but we'll be unsympathetic to those around us who are failing. And when we slip down our league table, we'll feel humble, but we'll always feel like failures. In the school of rules, we will always either be swaggering or snivelling, and we miss out on Jesus. So come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus says, come into my school where the yoke is easy and the burden is light. 
And Jesus takes us and he enrolls us in his school where we can be humbled by our own moral uselessness, yet be confident in our relationship with him, the one who will never break a bruised reed or snuff out a smouldering wick. Such is the privilege of all those enrolled in the school of Christ.